This video is on D3.1, which is reproduction, and we'll talk specifically about standard level content relating to human and animal reproduction. Animals are sexual reproducers, unlike this bacterium that is an asexual reproducer. So in asexual reproduction, that is going to produce genetically identical offspring. Those are known as clones. And because of that, there's no genetic variation. For things that reproduce asexually, the only source of genetic variation is going to be mutations, maybe gene transfer. But there's no genetic variation produced by the reproductive process itself. So this only requires one parent, which is an advantage, um, and it can be an advantage if this organism is well adapted to its current environment. Sexually reproducing organisms tend to have longer term success in changing environments due to the variation they get through their reproductive process. So in sexual reproduction, we are going to be producing genetically unique offspring. So this is a big source of genetic variation. It requires two parents. A lot of variation is produced in the production of gametes, that's meiosis, and in the fertilization process of those gametes. So there's a lot of opportunities here to create variation in the offspring. And this is great for changing environments because it provides the possibility that some members of the population have variations that are needed for survival in that new environment. Meiosis is covered more in depth in another topic, but just to review, this is the process of creating gametes, and it produces four haploid cells, um, and each of these cells is genetically unique. So unlike mitosis, which is a great illustrator of continuity, meiosis is a great illustration of change because the cells produced here are all genetically unique. Now, if we think about each um, cell being unique and the fact that only one out of many cells are going to fuse in that fertilization process, this creates the opportunity for lots of different combinations of alleles to exist in the offspring of sexual reproducing organisms. Sexual reproduction is going to include the fusion of a male gamete with a female gamete. So here I've shown the um, human gametes, the female ovum or egg and the male sperm and male and female gametes tend to have some very different qualities. So male gametes tend to be motile. That means that they move, whereas female gametes tend to be sessile. So they're staying in one place and the male gamete is moving towards them. Female, sorry, male gametes tend to be smaller while female gametes are larger. Some of that has to do with the fertilization process. So for example, this egg is going to have all of the like organelles that the embryo or that zygote will need, plus some yolk and some other things, whereas the male gamete is really just needed for its chromosomes. In regards to their size, or sorry, their number, um, male gametes, there tend to be many of them, whereas female gametes, there tend to be few. And in terms of the food reserves, again, this has to do um, with what parts are going to remain in that um, embryo or in that zygote. Male gametes tend to have very few food reserves, only enough for itself, but the female gamete will have a large food reserve like a yolk for that embryo as it is growing. So we're going to be drawing the male reproductive anatomy. I think it's easier to draw the male anatomy from the side view rather than the front view. So we'll do that. Um, we'll draw them first and we'll go back and label and annotate later. So first I'm gonna draw the testes. This is the site of sperm production. And just off of the testes is a structure called the epididymis where sperm will go um, to mature. Now, coming off of this structure is um, a tube called the sperm duct. You may have also referred or heard it referred to as the vas deferens. Um, either one would be fine, but I'll call it the sperm duct just so that we're clear what's going through there. So during an ejaculation, sperm would leave and go through this sperm duct and it's going to go out the penis and it goes in this really kind of strange loop-de-loop. -loop. Um, I hope that you're drawing this in pencil and not pen 
because we're going to go back and erase some things where we have um, some input from other glands here. So this is going to go out the penis. And so I'll draw that here. The urethra, which is what this tube is, is an opening inside the penis. Okay. And so I've just drawn the penis there. If you're kind of wondering how this fits into overall anatomy, here would be like the, the lower chest area. Okay. Here would be the scrotum. And then you'd have like a butt cheek somewhere over here and a leg. Okay. So, well, maybe it would look more like a leg and then a butt cheek. So something like that. Okay. So something like this. So this is how this is fitting into the overall anatomy like that. That's not as important. We'll talk about more of these tube situations. So why does the sperm duct go in this roller coaster orientation? Well, it's moving around the urinary bladder. So the urinary bladder is sitting right in here and the um, sperm as it's traveling through here is going to be added to fluid from two different glands. So I'm going to draw a, or a race part of here. I'm going to draw a little duct to um, a little gland. Okay. Right here, just like that. Okay. And that is something called the seminal vesicle. Now this urethra is going to join in with the urinary or sorry, the sperm duct is going to join in with a tube coming from the urinary bladder. So I'm going to draw that junction like this. Okay. All right, so if um, urination is happening, urine is leaving the urinary bladder and then traveling outward that way. If an ejaculation is taking place, sperm and then semen is traveling through this um, sperm duct and then outward this way. I have one more structure to draw in here, which is the prostate gland. The prostate gland sits right in here in between or right near that junction um, of the sperm duct and the tube coming from the urinary bladder. So I'm just going to draw it as kind of sitting right underneath of them. Okay. And then we're going to label these. So uh, let's add some labels and functions. Um, let's start with the testes. That's the one that we drew first. Okay, so the testes, I'll put the label, let's say over here. Okay, um, testis is singular. Uh, testes would be plural. So this is one testis. And that produces both semen and testosterone. This structure here, the epididymis, is again the site of sperm maturation and storage of sperm. So getting, holding it until ejaculation. So there's our structure and our function. This is the sperm duct, also known as the epididymis. That's going to carry sperm and semen during ejaculation. We have the, let's see, let's do this in order. We have the prostate and I'll put the information for the prostate maybe over here because I'm running out of room. So the prostate is going to be um, a or a gland that produces fluid that is high in carbohydrates. So we have semen, which is the collection of the sperm and the fluid. The prostate is responsible for producing part of that fluid, which is high in carbohydrates. So the sperm has energy while it is is kind of moving through the female reproductive tract. The seminal vesicle produces part of the semen, um, and that is a very alkali fluid to help combat the acidic pH in the vagina. And then we have the penis over here, which is going to deposit semen in the vagina, like as close up to the cervix as possible. And the last structure um, is the scrotum. And the scrotum uh, is that sack of skin that contains the testes, and it's holding them away from the core of the body. They're hanging outside of the body to be at lower body temperature. So sperm production needs to take place at something lower um, than that 37 degrees Celsius. So how did I do here? This is what our diagram was supposed to look like. So again, you can see the testis and the epididymis and then the sperm duct. They're not showing it going all the way around here, but the important features are the seminal vesicle and the prostate and then out through the urethra. You could alternatively draw this in a front view. I don't because it seems more difficult. I would, however, make sure that I'm familiar with identifying structures in this front view. You may see 
see this on an exam question. So it's everything we just drew, just noting that there are two testes um, and each with its own epididymis and branch of this um, sperm duct two seminal vesicles, one for each side, and then one prostate here in the middle, leading out through the urethra and the penis. Now we're going to draw the female anatomy. And the good news is that the female anatomy is much more simple to draw. The bad news is that the physiology is a bit complicated, but that's for another time, yeah? So I'm going to draw this female anatomy from the front view. I think that view is easier. So I'm going to start with the vagina. And the vagina is actually a muscular canal. So I'm going to draw it as such. Okay, so I have this like opening here. Okay, this would open into the vagina. You'll see that later. And then this wall here, this is actually the vagina, this muscular wall. Okay, and that is eventually going to widen into the muscle that makes up the uterus. So there's a narrowing here, okay, right around here that narrows before you get to the rest of this muscular wall in the uterus. And that narrow part here is called the cervix. So the uterus and the vagina are both muscles, which is really cool because it means that they can expand and contract. So there I've got the finished part of my uterus. Um, on the outside here, we have these um, labia, which are going to protect the inner genitalia. So labia is an external feature. The vagina is an internal feature. Then we have the ovaries. So the female will have two ovaries, one on either side, and they connect to the uterus via the oviducts. Okay, so I'm just going to draw them like this. Maybe I'll kind of like erase this part of my uterus here. So the oviducts are going to be in a position like this, okay? So again, this is why I usually draw in pencil and then I go over it in pen when I'm doing an exam. Lining the inside of the uterus is a highly vascular tissue called the endometrium. So I'm gonna take something a little bit thicker or draw this as a thickened line. And this again is called the endometrium. We'll go back and label that a little bit later. And I think I've got just about everything from my list right now. Okay, so let's add some labels and functions. So we have the labia or the vulva, either word that you want to use is fine. And that's really there for protection of the inner parts of the female reproductive tract. Then we have the vagina, and that is a muscular wall. It's the site of ejaculation from the penis and also serves as the birth canal um, during the childbirth process. We have the cervix. Okay, so I'll draw a line here. The cervix is this narrowing part right here, and the cervix is there to do a couple of things. It's going to protect the fetus during pregnancy, and then it can also dilate during childbirth. So so typically a cervix um, has a hole of about uh, one centimeter, so about the pinky size, and it's generally plugged with a mucus plug to prevent pathogens from entering. During childbirth, that cervix will then dilate to about 10 centimeters to allow for the passage of the baby. Leading, uh, let's see, where are we to next? So past the cervix, ah, that's right. Okay, I have the uterus, that thick muscular wall that is the site of fetal development. And because it is a muscle, it can contract to squeeze the baby out during childbirth. And it connects to these structures called ovaries. Ovaries are going to be the site of egg production. They also produce hormones such as progesterone and um, estradiol. And let's see, they are connected to the uterus via these things called the oviduct. You may have also heard them referred to as fallopian tubes. That would also be fine. And let's see, the oviduct does a few different things. First of all, it's going to catch the egg um, as it's ovulated, but this is also the site of fertilization. So the egg is released from the ovary into the oviduct. Meanwhile, sperm was deposited in the vagina. It will actually swim upwards and will meet the egg here. So this is the site of fertilization. And then if um, this egg becomes fertilized, it becomes an embryo and that embryo will travel through the oviduct until it gets to the endometrium. So I'll draw a line over this way maybe for the endometrium. I'll put this label all the way 
way over here. Um, the endometrium is that highly vascular lining, and this is where the embryo would implant, okay, um, if uh, fertilization has taken place. And so here you can see those features that we drew in the front view. Um, you can choose whether you want to draw it from the front view or the side view. I think the front view is easier to draw, but you do have to be able to recognize features using the side view. You might find this in an exam question. So how do we tell what we're looking at? Well, I'm generally looking for a couple of different openings. There are three different openings leading um, from the outside to the inside in females. So you have the anus, which would be attached to the large intestine. I usually try to find that first. And then that's going to be all the way posterior towards the back. On the anterior or front side, you'll have the urethra, which leads to the urinary bladder, and the vagina is going to be in the middle. So that's what we want to look for. So I would see the labia here leading into the vagina, the narrowing right here at the cervix, and then I have the uterus, one of those oviducts, and the ovary. So we've studied the anatomy of both the male and the female reproductive systems. In terms of physiology, we're going to be focusing mainly on the female reproductive system, and this is going to be driven by cycles and changes in hormones, okay? So these are going to move in cycles, and we want to be on the lookout for how one hormone affects the production or inhibition of another. These hormones are going to come from two different places. So we'll have some hormones that come from a gland in the brain called the pituitary gland. Maybe you've studied that before. And there are two of them. We have FSH, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, which stands for luteinizing hormone. We also have two important hormones produced in the ovary that is estradiol and that's a type of estrogen and we have another hormone called progesterone hormonal cycles in humans tend to last around 28 days and we're going to focus on the first 14 days um, and this time is called the follicular phase this refers to the follicle. The follicle is a ring of cells that is going to develop around an oocyte, that's an egg, okay, and it develops in response to hormones. So I love the name of this hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. It comes from the pituitary and it does exactly what it says it does. It's going to stimulate um, the production of the follicle. So this pituitary hormone, okay, FSH, starts to go up and it causes this follicle to develop. And what's really interesting is that this follicle, as it develops, secretes estrogen, okay, or estradiol. So that's maybe more specific. I'll try to use estradiol more consistently here. So this estradiol is produced by the follicle. That is in a positive feedback loop with the pituitary. So as this estrogen level increase, so does the level of FSH. That makes the follicle bigger, which produces more estradiol, which causes more FSH to be produced. So I can see the levels of estrogen and FSH increasing. At high enough levels, um, estradiol actually inhibits LH or FSH and starts to promote the production of LH or luteinizing hormone. Around day 14, the pituitary hormones, FSH and LH, peak, and this is when ovulation takes place. So we can see that here. So at ovulation, this follicle is going to release the oocyte or the egg into the fallopian tube. Now, the follicle, the main structure, is going to remain in the ovary and it will develop into a structure called the corpus luteum, which literally means empty body, okay? So we are now in days 15 through 20, and this is called the luteal phase in reference to the corpus luteum. That again is the structure that develops from this follicle that remains in the ovary after ovulation. This corpus luteum starts to produce both estradiol and progesterone. And progesterone is the real important one here because so far our progesterone levels have been relatively low. 
As this corpus luteum develops, it secretes progesterone. So we see progesterone levels start to go up and estradiol. And this is in a negative feedback loop with the pituitary hormones. So this progesterone causes a decrease in the pituitary hormones. The progesterone causes the endometrial lining to thicken in preparation for that embryo to implant. If no pregnancy occurs, okay, then the corpus luteum will break down. If the corpus luteum breaks down, that will cause progesterone levels to fall, which means that the endometrium lining cannot be maintained and that is shed as menstruation. That also means that there is nothing inhibiting the pituitary hormones, so FSH and LH will start to go up and we start the cycle all over again. And that may take you some time to really grapple with, but just the main uh, points from all of that is that FSH and estradiol are in a positive feedback loop with each other. FSH causes the follicle to develop. The follicle secretes estradiol. That stimulates more FSH, which, sec which causes the follicle to develop even more, more estradiol. You see what I'm saying? Progesterone is in a negative feedback loop with FSH and LH. So progesterone inhibits the pituitary hormones. And one of the reasons why that's really helpful is because we don't want to ovulate again, right? So if progesterone is increasing, that is preparing the endometrium for an embryo to implant. So that would assume that pregnancy is occurring. Well, you don't want to ovulate again if you are pregnant. So the inhibition of the pituitary hormones makes a lot of sense. Um, another main takeaway is that there is a hormonal communication between the pituitary, which is in the brain, the ovary, and the uterus. So this is the brain, this is happening in the ovary, and this is happening in the uterus. They are connected by hormones. And progesterone secretion is required for the embryo implantation. So if you get into studying pregnancy and fertilization, so for example, like higher level students, um, this will be very important for understanding that later on. The remainder of this video is going to focus on the fertilization process. Fertilization happens in the fallopian tubes, okay? And so we categorized that later or renamed that earlier as the oviduct. Either word is fine. And so the way that that works is that sperm will be ejaculated into the vagina, hopefully as close to the cervix as possible, and will actually swim up through the uterus and into the fallopian tube. The um, ovum or the egg will be released from the ovary and it will be captured by the oviduct and will move through the oviduct. And this is really where we should be having this site of fertilization, okay? And so this is where the fusion of the male and fam female gametes will occur. This is going to happen in a couple of steps, which is uh, more in depth if you're in higher level, and we'll talk about that another time. But the first thing that will happen is as the sperm is making its way to the inner part of this ovum, the cell membrane of the sperm is going to fuse with the uh, cell membrane of the egg. So there'll be some recognition proteins causing them to kind of like match up and fuse together. The sperm nucleus, okay, so that haploid nucleus is what actually comes into the egg. The tail of the sperm and the mitochondria is destroyed. The only purpose of the sperm is to donate that haploid nucleus. At that point, the egg will harden to prevent polyspermy. So poly means many, okay? So we, want, we don't want many sperm fertilizing the egg. We only want one sperm fertilizing the egg. So once one sperm has fused, then this egg will harden to prevent any more sperm from entering. The sperm nucleus will fuse with the egg's nucleus to create a diploid nucleus, and that is how we get the zygote. Fertilization normally occurs in the oviducts, but in a treatment called IVF, in vitro fertilization, fertilization is going to occur outside of the body. So this may be done for any number of reasons, including um, couples that are having fertility issues. And so the way that this works is that injections will be given to the woman to stop hormone production. So it stops FSH and it stops LH, which in turn stops estradiol and progesterone production. 
then very high levels of FSH will be injected so that not one but many follicles develop. Those are then harvested, so the follicles contain the eggs. Those are then harvested from the ovary, usually using some kind of a needle. They are then mixed with sperm, okay, um, outside of the body. So like here I'm showing it in a petri dish. Those um, uh, egg and sperm are allowed to mix. The fertilization takes place. Those fertilized eggs or zygotes grow into embryos. And at the embryo stage, embryos are planted, implanted back into the uterus um, where um, pregnancy can occur as normal. So you also want to make sure that you are injecting progesterone and, um, well, sorry, just progesterone to make sure that the endometrium lining that you're implanting those embryos into is nice and vascular, nice and well-maintained so that pregnancy can occur as normal.